Welcome to Right Now Workshop Podcast, where you can write a book and change the world. I'm your host, Kitty Buholtz, and this is episode 176, A Passion for History, an interview with Regina Scott, coming to you on Thursday, January 23rd, 2020. I'm still excited to say 2020. It just feels like we've got this whole fresh carpet of snow that has no footprints in it sort of year in front of us. I always feel that way in January, even though I live someplace now that doesn't have snow. But I guess I shouldn't be too disappointed because I've been living in places that don't have snow for quite a few years. But I was kind of hoping for more in Sweden. Oh, well. Listen, I got a couple of quick things to tell you before we get on to the interview. First thing... A week or two ago, I was telling you that I was reading some really great books on habit. I think uh, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg and Atomic Habits by James Clear. I finally just got my uh, paper copy of Atomic Habits from the bookstore after I ordered it. Yay! Uh, I can't wait for the weekend so I can get started and just like ah, read this wonderful book. People might be going, really? That's what you do on the weekend? But yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of other things I do like watch Hallmark movies and do puzzles and read other novels. But uh, yeah, I really also like uh, anything that has to do with the brain and helping your brain to do the things that you want it to do and also working with your brain so that you can use it the way it's already kind of leaning towards doing. Okay, so I was talking to you about habits. And one of the things that we need in order to create a habit is a trigger. And I was saying that in my writing... Uh, I need to get back into a habit, but I didn't have a trigger. There wasn't any certain thing that was making my brain go, oh, as soon as you get a cup of tea every morning, that's your trigger that now you're going to sit down to write. No, that's not, it's not what I do. I don't drink tea and there wasn't anything else that kind of did that thing. And I don't write every day. I have um, like big writing blocks that I plan out because that works better for me. Well, that is, remember, that was one of the other things that I said, I think this will work better for me rather than forcing myself into this, quote, common wisdom of writing every day. And then funny, right after I talked to you guys, I was listening to one of the podcasts, uh, podcast episodes for the Creative Pen podcast. And now I have to go back and figure out which one it was and who was saying it. But the woman who Joanna Penn was interviewing was talking about it wasn't specifically about habits. I can't even remember what it was, which is going to make it a little bit difficult to find. But she was talking about um, like organizing maybe or organizing your life or your time or I'm not sure. But at one point she said, yes, one of the things you need to keep in mind is that it may not work for you to write for an hour every day or write 500 words a day. It might work better for you to write in blocks, you know, once or twice a week or something like that. And I was I was on the treadmill, I think, and I was like, yes, I knew there was at least one other person like me. So I've been working on making that work. Plus, I've been using Susie Mae Warren's um, planner, the one that we've talked about several times on the show, mybrilliantwritingplanner.com, if you want to go look for it. Um, it's super duper good. And since it's January, it's still a really good time to buy it. Um, so I've been using her planner. And when you buy the planner, you get her planning course, which is uh, how she put all the pieces and sections and stuff together to work the best for her. And therefore, these might be good ways for you to try using it. And so she talks about um, using blocks of time and she moves blocks. If something comes up and interrupts what she was going to do today, then she just moves today's stuff to a different day and and plans to uh, you know, the things that got inter that interrupted her, she'll take that from another space that would have been for that kind of work. Anyway, so that happened to me on Tuesday. I got involved in something that I meant for it to only be a minute, and then it was an hour, and then I suddenly realized I had clicked on a button that you can only make changes in the next 24 hours, and after that it's set, and I'm like, oh, this is not what I wanted to do with my time. But now I'm kind of committed because now I have to absolutely finish this thing so that when 24 hours is up and I can't make any more changes, I have I know that it's absolutely finished. So that took probably half or three quarters of my Tuesday, and my Tuesday was supposed to be 100% writing. It also messed with my gym schedule, and I ended up going to the gym at 4 p.m. instead of 6 a.m. It was totally full. I was having absolute social anxiety because there were so many people, and I was like, holy crap, there's not nearly this many people at 6. And literally every single machine that was on my workout schedule for that day 
had somebody on it. I'm like, done. I am done. <laughs> I'm going home and I'm going to have some hot chocolate or something. I can't remember what I had, but I, I just needed comfort food. And I think I watched a TV show or something. Oh, Bletchley Circle, totally cool. Um, that's all I got to say. Netflix, Bletchley Circle and Bletchley Cir- Circle San Francisco, which I've now just started. Um, women who were code breakers in World War II, um, only now, poor things, don't have a, a real job anymore. And these men still don't care that these women have a brain. And so they kind of go off and do things on them on their own, like solving crimes. Totally awesome. Okay. Sorry. Very excited about things today. <laughs> a lot of things. So I took Susie May's idea and said, okay. So Tuesday, I ended up doing a whole bunch of left brain stuff. So I just moved a whole bunch of other left brain stuff that I was planning on doing Wednesday anyway into Tuesday. Tried to get all of Wednesday's stuff done on Tuesday so that then Wednesday could become my new Tuesday, which was my writing day. So yesterday, I did writing or writing related stuff all day, meaning I had to find all of my notebooks, all of my notes, all of my digital files, everything everything that I could think of, because I have taken so many notes on this book, I'm so ready to write it. Um, But they were in different places, partially because of moving a lot over the last couple of years. Um, I finally got started writing at two o'clock and part of my brain was like, it's already two o'clock. It's too late. Your day is ruined again. And then the other part of my brain went, it's not ruined. It's only two (laughs) o'clock. Just write for a couple hours. You'll be fine. But I got on a total just you know, one of those wonderful times when you're so connected to your story, you just have no need to stop. You're not out of energy. You're not out of ideas. You know exactly what's going on, which, you know, is partially because I've been thinking about this story on and off for at least two years. So between 2 p.m. and around, I don't know what time it was exactly, maybe seven-ish, yeah, maybe seven, um, with some writing, with some stop breaks in between where I had to stop and go, okay, I know the next thing that happens is this, but how exactly does it happen before I sit down and start writing it? So between two and seven, I, I wrote 2,506 words, 2,506 words. That might be the total of all the words I wrote last year. Maybe not. I'm not sure. I deleted a lot of words last year, but it felt like it. And I'm so happy. And I just feel like, oh, the world is a good place again. (laughs) So some ideas for you. Um, My blocking, that's not my idea, Susan May Warren's blocking idea that I did this week totally worked. You should try it if you if this sounds like something that you could do. So I was planning on writing all day Tuesday, doing a whole bunch of left brain stuff on Wednesday. Some left brain stuff got started and then crap, I had to finish it on Wednesday. So I moved all of Wednesday's stuff over to Tuesday and all of Tuesday's day, which was just to write, onto Wednesday. So that was a wonderful success. But then I had to ask myself, okay, What are you going to do Wednesday morning to make sure that you don't get involved in anything else and you start writing right away? So remember, I didn't actually start writing right away because I had to find all of my notebooks and files and digital files and everything. But I remembered something that I was going to try that I thought was had worked before. Um, I don't do this. I haven't in the past done this much, but I'm starting to do it more. I had created a playlist just for this series. So this is The Strays of Loon Lake, which is a small town sweet romance series. And I had created a play a playlist um, first in iTunes, but then I tried to sort of recreate it in Spotify so that I could add a whole bunch more new songs to it. Um, And it's like all these songs that just make me feel like happy thoughts about this small town, which sort of is a compilation of several small town spaces that I've lived in. Um, So I had this music playing and the whole time I'm thinking, yeah, this is my Loon Lake writing music. Oh, this is great. It's my Loon Lake writing music. Oh, listen to the words in this song. Yes, that's exactly what Danny would do or Jazz would do or that's what Jax is definitely going to do. That's what Tabitha might say. And so it was I was really happy I had picked good music. So I had been thinking about the story even while I'm like looking for all these files. So it totally prepped my brain. By the time I had everything, I was ready to start writing. Two o'clock came, you know, tried not to think about the fact that it was halfway through the day. I was totally ready. And then I had this fantastic 2,500 word day. 
And of course, the six, you got to remember all the numbers when you're counting the words because it just makes you happy. Um, so found my trigger for my habit. So ask yourself, what other sorts of things are you trying to create a habit for? What can be the trigger? Um, remember, I had also said that um, Tuesday, I ended up kept putting off the gym because I had to finish this thing. I ended up going at four and it was a total disaster for me. Um, just mentally, <laughs> mentally a disaster ended up being a physical disaster. Everybody was on every single machine I needed to use. And I was like, okay, <laughs> Anyone who wants to, you can hold me to this. I am a morning gym person. That's it. So my trigger at this point is don't let it be like that one Tuesday afternoon. <laughs> Just get up and go to the gym now. That was horrible. So I don't know if that's a good trigger. But if I just keep remembering, remember how bad it was that Tuesday, then I'll be like, no, I'm going to get up and go right now. <laughs> that's what I did this morning and it worked out perfectly. So habits, triggers, try new things if you need to, um, block your time and see whether or not if something disturbs this block, you can just exchange it for the block that, you know, ended up being happening today. Um, it makes a lot more sense with Su when Susie Mae says it. <laughs> so hopefully that will be helpful to you as you uh, work on getting more words written this January. Yay! Yay for a new year and the first month of a new year. Yay. The other thing I wanted to tell you is the conference is totally on. It is so on that I'm so excited. I almost wish it were happening right away because I'm so happy. I'm also glad that it's not because I have a lot of stuff to do. I have so many ideas, you guys. This is going to be a great conference. I'm so excited. I hope that you can make it. So the right net, the first annual maybe. We'll see how everything goes, whether or not it should be every year or every other year. The first Right Now Workshop Writers Conference is definitely scheduled for October 7th through 11th, 2020 here in Malmö, Sweden. Yay! Uh, I don't have the location yet, but I have so many ideas for potential great locations. There's a couple that are just very kind of um, artsy creative buildings. There's one building that's from the 1400s and it's just beautiful. Um, I just can't even believe that you could build something, you know, 600 years ago and it's still standing and still looks fabulous. Um, and then some more contemporary places. So haven't nailed down the place yet. I do have two great speakers now. Um, I am not going to say any more yet until we get some things like totally ironed out, but, um, really, really cool topics. And um, yeah, I can't say any more yet, <laughs> but I will tell you soon. Two great speakers, plus um, quite a few speakers that I think are going to be uh, yeses, which is also very exciting, and in several topics, and in not just fiction. So um, we've got things on research uh, of different uh, genres in fiction. We've got some stuff that is not fiction, so that will be good. And um, and this is just the beginning. This is just January of me planning for an October conference. It's going to be so incredible by the time it gets here. Um, part of the reason why it's um, 7th through 11th, so five days, the conference itself is Friday and Saturday, the 9th and 10th. Um, but I wanted, this is a beautiful area of the world, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to make this your vacation destination writers conference. So the first two days, Wednesday and Thursday, will be an optional add-on package that is va basically vacation items. So uh, tours and stuff that I will uh, pre-planned for you. So basically I'll have planned out two full days of seeing fabulous things in Melma and in Copenhagen, Denmark, which is only a half an hour train ride away. And, um, and I'll have totally planned out for you. Also, you can just um, not take that option and come early and do your own thing <laughs> or stay late and do your own thing. And then the conference itself is the Friday, Saturday. And then the second optional package will be the Sunday portion, which will probably only be about half a day, maybe six hours at the most, but probably, yeah, in that four to six hour range, because I figure some people might want to start, uh, you know, getting to the airport on a Sunday afternoon. Um, that is going to be all the spiritual side of creating. So um, I have a couple of ideas on uh, where I want to go with it. There's one thing that I'm almost certainly going to use from a Brene Brown book. Um, she's got 
great books. I love every single one of hers. And I just finished listening to the audiobook of Braving the Wilderness. Check it out. Great book. And it made me think, oh my gosh, there's this two or three, ta- two or three things in it that I'm like, this is what we need to talk about and encourage ourselves and like just get really filled up on creative energy. So um, Sunday will be all about kind of the spiritual side of creating and all about renewing creative energy and that sort of thing. So yay, super excited. Okay, that is it for the announcements. I have a great interview for you. Regina is just so interesting and she's done so many things in the name of research. I hope that she encourages you to go try a whole bunch of things. Live your life even fuller in the name of research. So here we go with Regina. Have a great writing week. Today's guest is Regina Scott. Regina is the author of more than 45 works of warm, witty historical romance. Her writing has won praise from Booklist and Library Journal, and she was twice awarded the prestigious RT Book Review's Best Book of the Year in her category. A devotee of history, she has learned to fence, driven four in hand, and sailed on a tall ship, all in the name of research. She and her husband of 30 years live south of Tacoma, Washington, on the way to Mount Rainier. Welcome, Regina. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad you're here. This is fun. I I did not realize until I looked at your website that you write one of my favorite kinds of books to read, the kind that is the fabulously guilty pleasure that I would never want to try to write ever, but I love, love, love reading them. And that is uh, Sweet Regencies, even though that's not the newest book that you have out, but that's true. Yeah, I just wanted to tell you, like, I love Aww, those books. Thank you. And when I was looking at the covers, I was like, I think I've read some of your books. Oh, bless your heart. <laughs> so why don't you just kind of take us on a journey? Um, it, it looks like um, history is definitely your forte. So tell us how you got started and, and what, what you love so much about it. Um, I, I like all history. I mean, anything in history to me is is just so interesting. Um, but I particularly was drawn to the Regency period. And I really think it was one particular author. Um, when I, you know, a lot of us grew up reading, right? Of course, we read everything, you know, yeah. and I always knew how good a book was as to how far it took me away from the real world. So you no longer hear what's going on around you. You no longer notice anybody. You know, you're just so into it. And uh, I had been having trouble finding that kind of a read. And when I was in college and my mom handed me a Regency romance by Elizabeth Mansfield. And I remember to this day her saying, Regina, Regina, come set the table. Regina Ellen, come set the table. And it was like, who, what? You know, because I was nice. so deep into Regency England. And at that point it was just like, I was gone. That's it. I love this period. I want to write about it. And so, yeah. That's awesome. There's a part of your brain that's like, just ignore that. There is no setting of tables. That's in right. Regency exactly. London. I'm in all my acts. I don't, you know, I'm sorry. I'm dancing with the Duke. I don't have time to set tables. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, it's such a different, like, and I didn't think about it too much until you just said something that made me remember, like, it was such a different life that we lived growing up because it was the paperback books that your mom had mm-hmm. that you either were or weren't allowed to read and <laughs> read anyway, <laughs> whatever you could find at the library, and then whatever you could come up with uh, pocket change to buy of your own. But I, there's so many books to read now. Like I'll never, I literally have been going through my bookshelves, having to put in a pile books that I probably would read, except that I have so many books and are they really books that I'm going to read before all these other books that I want to read more? And how many more years do I have left to live? (laughs) Oh, that culling process is so hard. (laughs) Thank you for saying that. I think only a real reader understands because somebody else was like, yeah, 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 it's hard. I'm like, no, no, it's horribly hard. <laughs> it's like giving, almost like giving away a child, you know, it's like, wait, but I like this one. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I would like this one if I just That's had right. time to read it. <laughs> That's right. It looks so good. <laughs> So then, so then you read, you fell in love. You were in college at that point? Yes. 
I was, and I really wanted to do the period justice. So I actually spent 10 years studying and reading and trying to understand before I finished my first regency. So, wow. Yeah. Were you a history major in college? Nope. 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 I was one of those sort of jack of all trades. I, I always knew I wanted to be a writer, but I had this in my mind that writers starved in attics and that didn't really sound attractive to me. So I kept trying to find something else that would pay for the writing, you know, so I yeah. was a daycare uh, director. I was a nanny. Uh, my father kept saying, go back to college, go back to college. So then I became a technical writer and then I became a scientist. And so I've done all kinds of things until I finally said, what are you doing? Go write. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. That's very similar to me. Like, this is what I want to do, but I don't want to be starving. And mom and all of my teachers say that I will starve. So mm -hmm. what can I do while I'm writing? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> nice. So then you are using all of your personal free time doing all this research. Yes. Yep. Wow. Okay. So for people who aren't familiar, and even though I, I sort of, oh, how do I say this? You know, there's like, the good chocolate that's your, your go-to chocolate you buy in the grocery store. And then there's like, I went to Paris and I had this chocolate and it, I don't know how much it cost, but it felt like it cost a million dollars. And <laughs> like, I only had one little bite at a time. So, and I mean this with all the love in my heart, because I buy a lot of chocolate bars at the grocery <laughs> store. Regency Romance are my chocolate bars. I, I don't always remember who wrote them. I can't remember what period Regency even is. I just know this is the cover that will make me really, really happy when I read it. <laughs> <laughs> so for people who aren't that familiar, um, tell us what does Regency mean and um, is there such a thing as a not sweet Regency romance? Because I swear 90%, maybe 100% of all the ones I've read don't have like hot steamy sex scenes in them. Um, so first, the, the technical Regency is like 1811 to 1820. Um, but when, when Prince George was basically the King of England because his father was mad. Um, and so they had to have a regent, hence the regency. But the, oh. the feeling of that period really runs from the late uh, 1700s up till about 1830, when around the time the Victoria came to the throne. So okay. it's, it's a, it can be a much broader period than that really technical regency. Um, and it's the same time when Napoleon was rampaging across the continent, you know, for people who have watched, um, what is it, the... Um, like a master and commander and those kinds of things, you know, or the sharp series. Um, it's that same time period, you know, that's when Jane Austen was writing. So she's the mother oh. of all the Regency writers, right? Oh. You know, they were contemporaries to her, but you know, they're Regencies to us. But so, you know, that's, it's that, um, that time period. So, and okay. then to your other question, uh, the next person that sort of took Jane Austen's kind of uh, style and the time period and really popular popularized it was Georgette Heyer. And okay. she, yeah. people just love her, you know. Um, and so a lot of books then kind of followed that same pattern. Comedy of manners, a lot of times in the drawing room, you know, the tension of society. Um, but there's a whole nother branch now of much hotter regencies. <laughs> um, so I, I tend to like the sweeter ones. That's just, that's just what I prefer to write. But there are some definite, there are definitely some very good um, steamier historicals, if that's, you know, what people like these days. Yeah. And um, so this, this original branch of, of regencies, do they, do they seem to all have some kind of humor, like a Jane Austen-esque humor? Because either they mostly do, or I only pick up the books that look like they're going to give it to me, and then they do. <laughs> That's right. Um, not all. Some are more rompy, and I must admit, I, I don't ever stray toward the more dramatic. My t mine tend to be, you know, have some humor in them, and I have a few that I would actually push on out and say they're, they're literally romps. You know, it's, it's silliness from day one. Um, but, uh, but there are ones that are more serious and, and darker. There are some people have gone 
to um, where the paranormal, so that there's ones where the hero's a ghost or the, you know, there's a vampire, you know, or that kind of thing. So there are some little edgier ones out there too. Wow. Okay. That sounds fun too. <laughs> All right. So, um, so thank you for indulging me and my little, um, Regency romance heart. <laughs> now, um, the book that is, I believe it's you, still your latest book, unless you've had, um, another new release since, uh, you and I started getting, getting ready to start talking. Your newest book then is called A Distance Too Grand, right? Uh, technically, yes. Although last Friday I did launch a new Regency series. So. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> let's talk about a distance too grand and then yes. we're going to have to come back to Regency. <laughs> okay. So, um, so tell us about this. This is actually with a new to you publisher, right? Yes. Yep. This is, um, with Ravel. I am so happy to be with them and I cannot say enough nice things about them. They are just wonderful to work with. Um, but I, I, had, I dabbled in Americana here and there, and I wanted to do, um, I wanted to do something grand. I wanted to do something big, you know. So I envisioned this story about a, a young lady who is a female photographer, and at the point where, I mean, she's tutored under her father. Her father has now passed away, and if she's going to continue, she has to step out, and she has to do it on her own. And he had one last contract which he had signed before he passed, which was to photograph the first uh, army survey of the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. And so she shows up and says, hey, I'm your photographer, only to find out that the man leading the expedition is the man she once refused to marry. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, I have to say, <clears throat> they were very, um, they were very polite. They weren't uh, 21st century, you know, throwing um, nastiness at each other on social no. media kind of people. They were very <laughs> polite. <laughs> no, this is true. Which, yeah. honestly, I like that in a character. Um, yeah, there, there's, um, everybody likes different things, but I really like when somebody can be like, I really despise you, but will you please pass the butter? I, you know, <laughs> like just, uh, just good. And then Dot, oh my gosh. <laughs> I do enjoy Dot. She's, besides Meg and Ben, my main characters, Dot's probably my favorite. She says it like it is. She um, isn't afraid. She's been around the army her entire life and she knows how to deal with these guys and she knows what she's doing around her cooking and don't get between her and her cinnamon. <laughs> That's awesome. You've got some really great characters. It was really fun reading. Um, though I have to say one of the things that I didn't quite realize until reading your press release. And so this is a question. I didn't realize that this was the centennial year. I, I assume 2020, but tell me if it was 2019, the centennial year celebrating the Grand Canyon as a national park. Was that the celebration? Yes. And it was 2019. Okay. Um, was their was their 100th year as a national park. And in some ways that surprised me because you think of, of it as, as this quintessential American, you know, icon and yeah. that it wasn't a national park until 1919 is kind of surprising, you know, That's when you think really about right. it. Yeah. Okay. So then, the, so here's my question. I'm reading your press release going, wait a minute. Were, are you just one of those remarkable people that you stumbled across to date or just knew it and went, I know what I'm going to do because it'll come out in two years on the centennial? <laughs> or was it a total accident and you all went, this is great. Total accident. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, maybe your books are being sold in the Grand Canyon Park um, Tourist Center. We are hoping. We, we, I know they made a play for that. I haven't heard whether it worked or not, but I'm kind of hopeful it is. Oh, nice. Oh, if only I still lived in Phoenix, I would drive to the Grand Canyon just to a see the Grand Canyon for the fifth time and <laughs> just see if your books are there for you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, so North Rim, never been to the North Rim. If you live in, uh, this is this is me making a wild generalization based on living in Phoenix for seven years. But if you live in the southern area, you know, south, anywhere south of the Grand Canyon, then it seems to be that the tourists are all going to the south, and there's tons and tons of tourists, and it seems like um, the people I knew who are interested, like me, in going to the North Rim, when we find out 
the trial it will take to get because then you're like wait it is a giant hole so you would have to and there's around. still there's no bridge okay you still have to go around the giant hole yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so was there any particular reason that um you had them coming from the north or from the south was there anything historically that was interesting about the north rim or was it the first thing that the army actually did go see or I was looking, I looked at two things. One, there's an entire history of who's explored what parts of the Grand Canyon and that they didn't get to the North Rim as early. So um, that seemed like it was a little more, you know, unknown, you know, kind of thing. Oh, yeah. um, the other thing was I had to think about where the army would come from. And if they came from the South, it was a long way. So I, and, and it, I couldn't plausibly see make up a fort closer um <laughs> so i plausibly made up <laughs> a fort to the north because they could get there faster i didn't want them to be on the road i didn't want her to meet with him and then spend three weeks doing nothing but traveling through you know to get to the grand canyon i wanted it to be you know three four days we're there you know kind of yeah thing. So, <laughs> that's a good idea to do that with the north room now, okay, so um, I'm always looking for things that uh, readers can use as a takeaway. So if anybody is writing hi historical fiction, anything using real history or, I don't know, probably even present day facts in your fiction, um, this is an interesting question. Um, you were thinking through uh, what will work in my story that is actually still believable in the context of the, the, the greater reality and the re, mm -hmm. I don't know, real story, so to speak. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about how you work that sort of thing in, um, in any of your history. Like w what are some tips that you might give to others about making things work the way you need them to without making it completely outside the realm of believability? Sure. Well, I think first you have to start with a good foundation. You know, you need to know the area, you need to know the culture, you need to understand, you know, what your characters need and want, and then looking um, at the history through a lens, you know, of, through that lens, saying, all right, so if this is, this is the story I want to tell, how, how do, what would be the best way to do that? And having, a, a, I guess, a, a frame of reference, um, it's, I love it when history is accommodating. That's really yeah. nice. You know, um, the uh, the latest example I was I was I really wanted a little spa town in England, preferably on the on this on the coast across from France, across the Channel, and I had it in my head. I knew exactly what it was going to look like. This little horseshoe shaped cove and a little castle on the headland, and I had this whole thing in my head. And so then I started scouting, you know, looking through England to see oh my gosh, there was a town exactly like that. I was like, oh, awesome. I ran out of the room. I said, come to my husband. Come look, come look. I found my town. It's right there. You know, it's so, you know, it's really nice. I said, oh, isn't it wonderful when history is so accommodating? Yeah. But sometimes it's not. You know, yeah. sometimes, like I say, I, there was no fort where they could come from. All right, then look where all, where are all the historical forts? Where are the, the, um, travel, where are people traveling that they would need a fort to protect, you know, the people traveling through or there's unrest and they need a fort and go, oh, why didn't they put one there? <laughs> that would be very <laughs> yeah. accommodating. I'm going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. So you live in Washington right now and it, it sounds like you've lived there for a while. Okay, so for anybody. <laughs> oh, wow, really? Yeah. Well, that's cool. All right, so for anyone uh, listening, not in the United States, so we're talking the very upper left corner of the country. And the Grand Canyon is not all the way south, but it's pretty far south. So you have done a lot of very cool things in the name of history. Have you been able to take a trip to the Grand Canyon? Yep. <laughs> hey, I meant in the, in the name of research, but yeah, so tell us about that and how did it seem to you like the first time i just remember my first view it's it's so incredible that it's it's well anyway i find it shocking so so what was your first view and then how were you thinking about it when you were putting together the story 
I actually saw the Grand Canyon before I wrote about it, which was, which is good. Sometimes I go after, I actually get a chance to go afterwards and I go, oh, I got that right. Oh, I didn't get that so right. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it was very nice that I'd actually been there. Um, but uh, to me, it, it was surreal. I mean, you walk out, you know, you, you get out of the car, you walk out, you, you, you know, walk out to the very edge and you look and it's like somebody took an old fashioned uh, backdrop painting from an old movie and plunked it down in front of you. And you think this can't be real. It just is so rugged and some the shades and the tones and the textures, and it just seems to go on forever. And that, and the stillness. I mean, there were lots of people around, you know, tourists like me, but it just seemed so still, like everybody was kind of holding their breath. It was just, I don't know, I found it a very inspiring place. <laughs> Regina, you and I, sometime we need to get together and have coffee because we keep finding, or I keep finding <laughs> things where I'm like, me too. <laughs> <laughs> So my husband works in um, film and video games, special effects, animation, different things like that. And, um, and we love, love, love movies. We've both worked in the film and television industry. Oh, so cool. like um, the, the behind the curtain thing, like I get that. But when you walk up to something real and your first thought is, wow, this is like the most amazing um, movie backdrop I've ever seen. And you're just like, but it isn't one. But it isn't. How can it be real? It's... Exactly. Yeah. It is. It is mind blowing. I completely yeah. agree. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And just to, to give you one little fun thing. So one of my favorite memories, since we lived in Phoenix, we were able to go several times. It's oh. only, I don't know, four or five hour drive. Yeah. It's great. I got to go one time on Easter Sunday and um, there was a church service on the rim at, oh. at sunrise. Oh, and so, wow. It was amazing. But the most amazing part is, so there's, you know, hundreds of people facing the rim and then four or five people who are leaving, leading the service with their back to the rim. So right as the speaker said, and then he rose from the grave, the sun popped right up over oh, the North Rim wow. and everybody went, oh, and the person like stopped for a second and just looked around like they didn't like, know. What? 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 <laughs> oh, <laughs> Oh, I have got some great, great memories of that place. It's, it's amazing. So yeah, I was, I was very happy to read about it. Good. Yay. <laughs> well, I don't want to take you away from the new book, but so now we've got another new book. So tell us about what the other new book is. So as I was saying, I was looking to start my own town. I mean, it's about time. Don't you think I'm starting my own Regency village? That's it. That's um, right. <laughs> So, and it's set on um, the Dorset coast, so the sort of the south of England looking toward France. Um, the series is set in 1804, so before the technical regency, but very much still that, that feeling, the same style of clothing, the same um, culture. Uh, and it is at a time when Napoleon was trying desperately to invade, so there was a lot of fear um, that he was going to make it. He was going to, he had ships, he had something like 2,000 ships ready to take his troops, you know, fishing boats and anything he could get his hands on, all massing to start. They're just waiting for the right weather, the right everything to cross the channel. Um, and so everybody on the channel, on the England side was terrified. So plop down a little spa town that is known for coming for the waters and promenading and dancing. Um, <laughs> and it makes for a good, you know, a, a good bit of tension there. So. That was the genesis of the town. The little town's called Grace by the Sea, and that is the name of the series as well. And the first book, The Matchmaker's Rogue, um, came out last Friday, and the heroine is the hostess of the spa, so she has quite the position of authority and esteem in this little town. Um, and the, the rogue is the uh, gentleman from her past who she it was her first love who left because he wanted adventure and greater things and now he's come back with an agenda to unearth all the secrets of this little town and so they they also butt heads because this is her town and she's not messing it up <laughs> nice oh my gosh i have to read this one too <laughs> now regina do you do all traditional publishing or are you a hybrid publisher I am a hybrid writer, um, so I have Ravel, and like I say, I love them so much. Um, um, but I do, I, I 
I write a little more frequently than some traditional publishers like to put out books. So it's good for me yeah. to do other things. And even though I, I'm just so enjoying this series with Ravel, which is going to feature um, the history of our national parks, a number of them, um, I can't get away from my Regency. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I've been self-publishing those. So that's, nice. that's been fun. Um, yeah. I, I always thought I would be an awesome self-publisher. I'm very self-disciplined. Um, I love learning new things, you know, so this not, I'm not afraid of the learning curve. I'm a very hard worker, but, oh, I wish I could, I wish, I wish I had a dozen Ravels because they make it so easy and so, so wonderful. So um, we'll see who wants to get with the, what the future holds, but right now yeah. I'm hybrid. Yeah. So for people who are listening, who either are one and thinking about doing the other said so that they'll be hybrid or they're just um, thinking, which direction should I go? Pros and cons. Um, what are some of the things you mentioned? The thing that I hear most often from hybrid publishers, uh, hybrid authors, which is I can write faster than they can publish. Therefore, it just it's nicer for me to be able to publish more books myself. But what are some of the things that you see as um, either pros and cons or unexpected struggles, you, you mentioned a little bit of that, or the unexpected rewards? Sure. Um, I think it, it's, it's lovely. Um, I guess it's, I always say it's, it's like a, it's a double-handed, it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, not with Ravel, my covers for Ravel are gorgeous. But, <laughs> you know, every once in a while with a traditional publisher, you get a cover and you go, oh, hmm. What yeah. made you think a pink prom dress was a good choice, you know? <laughs> um, and then you have this fight and sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. Um, when you're self-publishing, you can say, this is what my hero and heroine look like. This is what they are wearing. This is what they are not wearing. Um, and you can, you know, you, you, you have more control that way. For I was surprised. For me, that is a double-edged sword because when you are traditionally published and you get the pink prom dress and the reader writes you and says, I am very disappointed with you. I always thought you were historically accurate. Don't you know that's a pink prom dress? <laughs> um, you say, yes, I didn't get to choose my cover. That was my traditional publisher, you know? Yeah. But when you self-publish and a reader writes you and says, what were you thinking, purple? Who wore purple? <laughs> you, all you can say is, I thought it was pretty. <laughs> now the other cool thing i read about you is that you have an entire closet full just of period costumes i do guilty <laughs> so that so, um that i'm trying to get my finger in the right place that right back there that's it <laughs> oh, oh nice okay that does look like quite a lot is probably in there <laughs> So, um, of course, I have the movie um, 27 Dresses in my head right now. But as soon as you were to pull back the cover, they would all just burst out. But, <laughs> so you must obviously have lots of Regency period costumes. Um, and so do you also, do you have anything that is in the Western period that you're writing about now also? Have you tried that yep. yet? Yep, yeah? I have several. Um, I have one that sort of, I'd say, I'd say Western Victorian wedding dress. So that's always a favorite. Um, I have one more turn of the century. Um, we think it was also a wedding dress, but we're not entirely sure, but it has the, the sweetheart necklace and neck, uh, necklace, neck, um, <laughs> neck pink here and, uh, the big pup sleeves and everything. So that's really fun. So, um, and then I have some odd things from the days when my husband, when we were younger, my husband and I used to do science fiction conventions quite a bit. So nice. I also have um, a full on, it looks like gold chain mail. Floor yeah. Length. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So. <laughs> from, from any particular book or movie or just. No, more cool. of a fantasy kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of thing. And yes. So yeah, and I have a crown, I, it has a snood and then it has the crown that goes with it up here and a big <laughs> staff embedded with stones. And it's, it's, uh, uh, I think it's, a, it's part of an, no, it's not elk. I have never quite figured out what the horn is on the end, but it's curved. We always say it's narwhal. I don't think it really is narwhal, <laughs> but we always claim that, you know. <laughs> nice. 
Oh, man. Now, I don't know that I um, specifically asked you whether or not you teach classes at writers' conferences or anything like that. Is that something that you ever do? I have from time to time. Uh, my husband and I moved uh, here about five years to go, go to be closer to family. Um, but where we used to live on the other side of the mountains in Washington, uh, I taught classes regularly with the, at the community um, education program on how basically from the idea to actually getting the manuscript done. And then once you have the manuscript, what do you do from there to publication? So I, yeah. I taught those fairly regularly. Okay, so I didn't give you any warning about this question. So just if something comes to mind, do you have any like uh, top tips, like to do's or don't do's that um, just always stays with you because you found them to be really helpful tips for people? The one thing that I keep seeing, and, and I'm kind of sad because again, with the internet, we have so much information at our fingertips. But I still have people come up to me and say, I want to get my book published. How much do I have to pay the publisher? Oh. And I just go, you don't. <laughs> okay, yeah. if it's a real, real, if it's a publisher, they pay you. You don't pay them. Um, if you choose to be the publisher, that's something else. If you choose to self-publish, then you are taking on that role and you choose the cover and you choose who formats and you choose all those things. Um, but there are still so many people out there who think I wrote a book. Now I have to pay someone to publish it and then they'll, they'll send me royalties. That's not how it should work. Yeah. So I always have to be so careful with that. Um, it hurts me to hear people who are taken advantage of. And unfortunately, there are a lot of scams out there. Yeah. And honestly, I keep thinking, well, certainly everybody knows about them now. And those scammers have no customers. But um, it was just this week I read a post, something on social media. And uh, the beginning of it was, I already paid my publisher $4,000 for blah, blah, blah. And I thought, oh, no. Oh, no. Why didn't anyone tell you? That's exactly. not a publisher then. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, I am. I am always surprised that like you say, that that still happens. Um, yeah. So definitely, if, if, you're, if you want to publish a book, look into that background and make sure you're getting, and there are, there are places that, that they call assisted self-publishing, but be careful because yeah. so much of that you can do all by yourself. You don't need to pay absorbent fees to people. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I like that. Thank you for mentioning it because I, I always forget because it just seems, um, and also I'm just not the kind of person who sees, who thinks about how many scammers in the world are still like making a wild business out of whatever they're doing. I know. No, me either. I tend to think the best of people, yeah. but, but I also want the best for people who are coming up in the industry. I want them to have a good foundation too and, and not be taken advantage of like that. Yeah. Yeah. So let's um, talk for a minute about your habits, your, um, how you form your schedule, not necessarily in a day or in a week, but overall, you have found a schedule that works for you. You have, oh, what is it? Do I don't, more than 45, more than 45 books for sure. So yeah. you've, you've figured out some kind of a, a way to work that works for you. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Because maybe there'll be some things that you do that somebody else will be like, you know what, it's beginning of the new year. I'm going to try that. Sounds like <laughs> it could be something that works for me. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I, I, you know, over the years, I've learned about how fast I can write. And I'm really inspired. I can go more than that. If I'm having a really bad day, it might be less than that. But I know about how long it takes me. Um, I'm also a multi-draft author. And that um, I always envy. I have a friend who sits down, writes the book, does one light editing pass, and she's done. Oh. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't write that way. Yeah. Um, so my first draft is very much getting a feel. Um, and maybe it's because um, when I first started writing, I'm, I'm what, you know, the whole pantser plotter thing. 
So I'm more of a pantser. I'm more of, ooh, I have this idea. Let's see where <laughs> it goes, you know? And I was definitely that way before I was published. Um, I would just sort of jump to this one and, oh, this is getting boring. I'm gonna go over here, you know? And, and But there's a couple problems with being a hardcore pantser. And one is when you get bored, you go to something else and no book ever gets finished. Oh yeah. And that's, that's not good. You don't, you don't make forward momentum if you never finish the book. It's a little hard to publish. <laughs> And the other thing with being a pantser is that sometimes you run down rabbit holes. You think, oh, this is really cool. I'm going to go, oh, I can't even plot my way back from this. I don't, huh, okay, back up. And so you waste, you know, you waste a good amount of time. Um, so I, and then once I got published, it's kind of funny. Publishers want to know if they're going to buy another book from you, what it's going to be about and how it's going to end. <gasps> Who knew? <laughs> Right. <laughs> so I had to think ahead and I had to plot. So, um, but I have found for me, if I plot it out to the nth degree, I lose interest. I already told that story. I don't need to tell it again. You know? Yeah. So I do enough. I do enough historical research to make sure it's plausible that, that this is what, that this could have happened in this time, in this place. Um, and I get a, kind of a feel for my characters and, and I have a basic sort of very, very high level outline of where I'm going, kind of the main, main big plot points, right? And then I start writing. Um, and my first draft probably looks a lot closer to a screenplay. It's, it's dialogue, it's um, a little bit, it's action, it's a very little narration. And when it comes to description, very many times the word just says describe. <laughs> and I don't stop to think, well, gee, is her dress pink? I wonder if it's, well, let's see, it's daytime. Is it muslin? Or would she be really showing off and wearing silk? Um, you know, if I do that, I, can't, I just bog myself down. And so yeah. I save that for the next draft. And I, and I write the whole book out. Um, and I also do something that I know is really odd in this day and age. My first draft is longhand with a pen in a blank book, in a journal. Wow. Um, because as I was going up through my other many checkered careers, um, writing longhand is creative, typing yeah. is analytical. And yeah. if I try to rough, I've tried a couple times to break myself, because it'd be so much faster if I could just type it the first time. Yeah. Um, but typing it is analytical. And once again, that editor hat stopped slipping on and going, oh wait, succumbed. Succumbed is a very big word. Do I want to throw it in now? Don't we save it for later? You know, it's, no, I just need to write the book. Um, and that first rough draft is really a voyage of discovery. I learn things about my characters. I learn um, the book that I'm working on right now, which is going to be the second in that Grace by the Sea series. I, as I was going through, I got to this one place and the hero was giving me some tension there. I thought, what's going on? And he confessed that he'd been in love with the person his cousin married. Who knew? I didn't plot that. How did you know that? <laughs> anyway, so I discover things about yeah. my characters as I go through. And I guess that's just the way my mind works. And um, it's fun, right? It is fun. And that keeps it interesting for me. Um, and then once I have that, then I go back and I type it all into the computer, I keyboard it all in. And um, as I'm going, then I think through, oh, do you want to use some cummed or what dress is she wearing now? Or, you know, and then I'm sitting at the computer and I can go, oh, you know, I forgot to look up drawing rooms for this particular period. I need to go jump over to the internet and look, I need to go look through my files. And, and I can do that without interrupting the flow, the creative flow. Um, so Let me stop you there and ask you a question because that was something I was going to ask you. Um, so to be clear, you've written the first draft. It's as you're typing it in and essentially making it into the second draft, that's when you're willing to stop for a minute, go do some research and come back? Yep. yep. Okay. So I make a note of things as I'm writing along that I need to check or double check um, or, you know, look this up kind of thing. And then the other thing for my time period, like I say, I, I, I do try really hard to be historically accurate. So I will even, as I'm writing... I'll use a turn of phrase and I'll think, huh, was that around in the Regency? So I'll put the word check over the top of it as I'm writing. And then as I'm coming back in, back through, I'll go and you can also see there's a very large dictionary back there. That is a 
a shorter version of the Oxford English Dictionary, and it dates all words in the English language and when they were first used. So then I'll go back through and go, okay, was this used? Good, I'm good. Oh, it wasn't. Boy, it sounds old. Okay, can't use that one. Um, And then I go and and change those things too. So yeah. Nice. That's my process. Yeah. I think that... um... Yeah, okay. research is always something that no, no matter what you're, re- I mean, even if you're just doing a tiny little bit of contemporary research, it's like, should I really stop right now and go look for a map of the streets in Chicago in this area that I'm talking about? And I keep telling myself, no, no, you really shouldn't. You should just <laughs> keep writing. <laughs> That's it. Unless it's such a big point. Um, that you know, if you don't get it right, the rest of the book will be completely off. And then if I if yeah. I hit something, I hopefully I've done that before I started this first draft. But every once in a while, something pops up, and I think, ooh, hmm, huh, boy, if I'm wrong about this, then this last third of the book is going to have to be completely rewritten. So maybe <laughs> I better stop and look that up right now. That's a good point. Yeah, to ask yourself, you know, wh- how much will it affect it? Do I have to stop in order to make sure? Absolutely. Because, uh, and it may not be for other people, but for me, I need to keep that flow. That's when the creativity really happens. That's when the exciting ideas and content comes out. And if I keep stopping myself, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, today, as you and I are, are doing this interview, which is a little bit before it comes out, um, was the first day that I got to start a new book in a long time, actually. This is very exciting. Yeah. But Here's the problem that I had. Um, Not problem. I just have to figure out how to deal with it in the future so that it's not a problem. But so I woke up this morning going, okay, today's the day. You go to the gym, you take a shower, and then it's writing all the way up until you interview someone. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking this is going to be great. But now... I'm listening to an audiobook as I'm running and every once in a while she says like one or two, not even a whole sentence, three or four words. And all of a sudden I'm thinking about Jax and Tabitha. Yeah, Jax would do that too. And Tabitha would be so mad about it. But now I'm thinking about that. I don't have a pen. I'm on a treadmill and I've missed the last five minutes of whatever audiobook <laughs> I've been listening to. And then I noticed it happened again in the shower and oh, um, no. something else. Was I making breakfast or something? I was doing something else. And finally I was like, oh my gosh. Okay, note to self, next writing day, have my notebooks and my pen and stuff ready. Take an extra pen to the gym if I need to. <laughs> That's it. Absolutely. Because part of it is you just have to figure out your own process, right? You do. Absolutely. I think everyone's different. Like I said, I mentioned my friend that can just sit down. Now, in a day, I'll write two to four chapters. In a day, she might write a half a chapter. But I'm going to, I'm going, but she's done. I mean, she's done. I'm going to take another, you know, so many weeks to take those chapters and turn them into a book. And then I'm going to read them through one more time. And then I'm going to send them to a critique partner and then I'm going to revise it based on the feedback I get from her. So by the time we're done, it's about the same amount of time, you know, but it's a completely different process. And I think it's really good. It's hard when you're first writing, I think, to figure out what your process is and what works for you. And I think your process can change and evolve over time. I'm finding right now um, for much of my life, as you, as you mentioned, writing, it was sandwiched in around other things. So I got very, very good of dropping into the story fast. And, you know, maybe it was only, you know, a page or two before I had to pull back out and go take care of the kids or, you know, do <laughs> something like that. Um, but now I'm at the point where I've phased out of almost all my other obligations and I get to just write. Uh-huh. And I sit down and I go, I have all day. What am I going to do? Huh. And so it's, I have to really think about it and, and, and maybe tweak it a little bit because it's so, I'm so used to writing in short bursts over, you know, the course of a day, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, after work, you know, that kind of thing. And now I have two, three, four hours to sit my behind in the chair and I'm going, wow, how do you do that for that long? So, <laughs> You know, I, ha- I have to think through. I'm still in the process of thinking through because it has been a very successful process for me. Yeah. Uh, and how do I adapt it now? Because the thought was, ooh, I have more time. I can write more. Maybe not. So 
I find yeah. myself going, oh, I've been sitting here a while. I should get up. There must be laundry. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, it's, maybe I should check social media. You know, it's, it's, I have to yeah. train myself. I have to, I have to really think through. So your process can change and it takes a while to figure out what best works for you. And some of the best, best advice I've heard recently is, know that process when you take a class when you go to a workshop when some other author says oh you should do this and think about your process that works and say oh that would work really well for my process or whoa that would throw my process out the window do i really want to do that maybe you yeah. do maybe the process isn't working so well but if it's working really well be careful because you can yeah. really derail yourself yeah yeah um so I mentioned my husband and I have been moving around a lot because of his job, which was super duper exciting in the beginning and absolutely exhausted, exhausting near, near the 15 year mark. Um, but now we live in the same place. We've been living in the same place for more than a year and a half. I'm so happy. That's awesome. <laughs> and so now I'm like, okay, I, I, have this thing finished now this is finished now this okay so so now I'm going to be able to write all day but also I'm doing these other things you know, I'm going to put on a conference I'm working on some other kind of big teaching and speaking things that um because that's just I love that plus I've got the podcast I'm like okay so it's not all day every day you're going to have to figure out how to get each of these things done but I was talking in the um intro to last week's podcast that I thought, oh, you know what? I'm gonna do uh, f for now. I'm gonna try what most, it, what seems like most people try, but maybe they're just vocal, um, <laughs> which is writing for a set amount every day or yeah. scheduling out their writing and mostly making it every day. And so I kind of tried that, and I got really nothing accomplished. And then I stopped and I asked myself, when I've gotten the most writing done, how has it worked best for me? And man, I think that, that is a great thing to ask yourself, just like absolutely. you did. Yeah, because absolutely. I came up with a new plan and today it worked brilliantly, which oh, is... Oh, yay. Congratulations. Thank you. So, so my, I mean, I got to try it, you know how it is. You're going to try it out, tweak it, make sure that it's really working. Um, but I need to write all day for like two days a week, which is the same as writing three or four hours in the morning, five days a week. Sure. And, but then I'm completely immersed and it's the only thing that I have to think about. Okay. And then everything else can wait one day for me to not answer emails or whatever. And then I can go back to doing all the left brain stuff that I need to do. There you go. Yeah. There I, I can't stop one thing at, because the timer says that it's time to stop and move on to the next thing. <laughs> That's hard. Especially if you're in the zone. If, if the writing's going really well and that timer goes off, you're like, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's the same way for, for the other thing when I'm doing left brain stuff. I'm like, okay, hold on, but I still have three more emails I need to send. It's really important. I'll get to my writing, okay, in a half an hour. And then they get to the end of the day. That didn't really go the way I thought it would. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. oh. Well, this has been so much fun. I love talking Thank to people you. about their processes and, yeah. uh, and, and you're, you're, you have so many different ways of, of coming at um, storytelling and, and writing. And I love how much you've shared with everybody. Is there anything else that you had on your mind that you wanted to say before we uh, start wrapping things up? I, I always say, I don't want somebody to be on the treadmill going, hurry up, you guys. I promised myself I'd run until you were done talking. <laughs> <laughs> No, I know ahead of time you and I had talked a little bit about, you know, the, the hands-on research thing, and I'm, I'm a big proponent of that. Um, I know it can be challenging sometimes for historical, you know, research, um, but there's so many things you can try. Children's museums, usually they let you touch and feel, you know, and things like that and experience more. Um, you know, ex there's a lot of experience now. I mean, like, as you read in my bio, I've sailed on a tall ship. That was so cool. I loved it. Um, the most, totally historically inaccurate, I'm sure, but the most fun thing about that, it, they're, they're, it's the Lady Washington and the Hawaiian Chieftain, which are both um, tall ships for our state. And we were going up the Columbia River and 
for they got bored. They, they were bored. You know, there's nothing going on. You know, the the sales are where they need them to be. The winds where it needs them to be. And so they had a little catapult thing, or like I guess like a slingshot, and they fired pancakes at the other ship. It was so fun. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> it's so fun because they're biodegradable. If they fall in the water, you know, nothing's going to happen, you know, so they, yeah. they lob pancakes at each other. I just, I wish I could use that in a book somewhere. That is just too much fun. That's so awesome. there's all kinds of things you can do. Uh, my, my dearest friend surprised me on a big birthday with a carriage ride. You know, they found a carriage in our local area and um, we w w rode this carriage through one of the big parks. And the best part was the coachman let me sit up front and drive. So it was, I got to drive four in hand, you know, and it was just like, ah. So, you know, there's a lot of really fun things. I mean, country dancing, English country dancing. Almost every big town um, has that opportunity to go and try the dances. You know, the contra dances today are very similar to what they danced in the Regency period. So, you know, go and go and try a contra dance. You know, there's all kinds wow. of things you can do to really get in there and feel what it felt like. And it makes your writing richer. And it might give you some ideas like pancakes to put in a book. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, okay. So you have two book ones that have just recently come out um, in the Ravel series. First, we started with the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. And then book two and three, we already decided which national parks. Yep. Book okay, two so. is Yellowstone. So I'm excited about that one. Um, I, I actually came across the research for it while I was doing um, the research for A Distance Too Grand. Um, and in 1886, um, you know, well, Yellowstone was our very first national park. Oh. And in 1886, uh, Nobody knew what to do with it. There was no National Park Service. They didn't know how to manage it. They didn't know what to do. And things were getting really out of hand. I mean, the buffalo were being slaughtered. The uh, people were, were vandalizing, you know, and it, it was just, it was terrible. People were breaking off pieces of, you know, Old Faithful to take home, you know. Wow. It was pretty bad. And so they gave control of it to the, to the army, to the cavalry. Oh. So wow. this is when the cavalry has ridden in to save Yellowstone. So I'm, I'm enjoying, that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun to write. Um, and then I always hoped that the third one, and it's going to be, is going to, was going to be set in Mount Rainier because that's in my backyard. <laughs> nice. Wow. Okay. And do you have uh, release dates yet? Uh, the Yellowstone book will be out in early October this year. And uh, the Mount Rainier book will be 2021 in October. Excellent. Wonderful. And then your other series, tell us again uh, what book one's called and when we might expect more books in that series. Sure. Book one is The Matchmaker's Rogue. Um, the second book is The Heiress's Convenient Husband. And it will be out in April. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Very good. Wow. This is great stuff. And oh. so... In general, uh, where can people find you in all of your books, which have got to be up to close to 50 now? <laughs> uh, the Heiress's Convenient Husband will be number 50. So I'm, I'm nice. pretty excited. <laughs> oh, you should have a party. I am think I'm, I need to talk to some folks and figure out a way to celebrate because, yeah, that, that is something. And I'm, I'm really blessed. I feel very, very blessed to have reached that number. Um, you nice. can find out all the information at www.reginascott, R-E-G-I-N-A-S-C-O-T-T dot -T -T com. And there's all the other information on my social media contacts and my email and my newsletter sign up. So you can find out when the next book is coming. That's right. I saw that today and I was like, okay, I have to find out because I love Regency. <laughs> so I'm already signed up. <laughs> oh, bless your heart. Thanks. <laughs> Awesome. Regina, this has been great fun. Thank you so much for taking time out of your writing day to share with us. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope your readers or your listeners are just excited to go out there and write about history. <laughs>